So um, just a reminder that the talks are always about um, something very specific. Uh, in practical terms, they are about happiness for the human being in daily living, happiness for the human being in this life. And happiness needs to be understood to be something very particular. Happiness through peace of mind. You can interchange the words. So you can drop happiness and call it peace of mind. But understand that peace of mind is the happiness available for the human being in this life. So changing our understanding of what happiness is a very significant uh, part of moving towards happiness moving towards what happiness really is, peace of mind. The way that the human being has been developed by life, has grown, um, has evolved in life, is for our evolution from baby through to adult and um, the uh, dynamic I'm going to talk about gets put in place much sooner, much earlier than adult. But the way that we've evolved um, seems to ingrain the belief, deeply, deeply ingrained belief, not a belief that we um, see as a thought, but a belief that becomes part of our self-identity. And that self-identity then drives us to look for happiness in the future in the form of circumstance meaning that the deeply ingrained identity believes that when life ha has been shaped by the seeker, by the doer, by the person, and it then looks a certain way, then because life looks a certain way, there will be happiness. That's the assumption. Oh, that my happiness that isn't here um, will be here one day once I get life sorted out. And that deeply ingrained identity we can call the belief that my happiness is to be found in outcomes. Outcomes are either pleasure or pain. Outcomes means how circumstance is in each moment. So in each moment circumstance really means a circumstantial outcome in each moment. So it's not um, necessarily talking about the outcome right at the end of a um, three-month task, let's say. That is an outcome. But at any point in the three-month task, in day two, that is the outcome of the task up to that point in time. So life is outcome. Life is circumstance. The flow of life, should I say, because there is more to life than just the flow of life. But when we talk about circumstance, we're talking about essentially outcome, which is either pleasure or pain. And we can use the word the flow of life, which really means the flow of circumstance. And so the flow of circumstance is either pleasure or pain. Your happiness is not to be found in the flow of life. Your happiness is not to be found in how circumstance looks. Your happiness is not to be found in pleasure or pain. When I say your happiness is not to be found in pleasure or pain, what it's really saying is your happiness isn't dependent on pleasure or pain. Your happiness isn't dependent on circumstance. Your happiness isn't dependent, dependent on outcomes. And yet... The deeply ingrained belief says my happiness is to be found in the future. The future is an outcome. The future is some future circumstance. The future is deemed to be a future that is pleasurable. The, the future that where we say my happiness is to be found in the future. My happiness is to be found in outcomes. My, my happiness is to be found in pleasure or pain, in circumstance. that is deeply, deeply ingrained, so deeply ingrained that it becomes a belief that masquerades as who we are. It is felt um, so intertwined with the rest of the human being that 
it is that uh, belief system which is essentially a psychological identity that meets life, that interacts with life. And that psychological identity is continually assessing the circumstance um, and judging it as valid or invalid on the basis that it believes that circumstance is what makes it complete. And that meeting life that way means involvement in life, means identification with life. Firstly, identification with the body, which is the aspect of the human being that interacts with circumstance. That's the part of the person that is part of circumstance. So first there is identification with the body, which is um, identification with a part of circumstance. And then that um, identification as the body identifies with the circumstance being either pleasurable or painful and judges it um, as either in line with what I think will make me happy or out of line. Now, that we can call our attitude to circumstance. And when the sense of self exists in such a way that it is deeply convinced that circumstance defines it, that sense of self explodes into uncomfortableness when circumstance um, is such that it feels like it is attacking that identity. And there's no mm, option. There isn't uh, a choice to act um, with identification and with attachment or not. The identification or attachment to the pleasure or pain of life will happen if the identity is there with its deep idea that it is added to by pleasure and taken away from by pain. So if that identity is there, it's not optional. It will just turn into resistance to life or attachment to circumstance. Um, so it's not about saying, okay, I should not be attached to circumstance. It's, it's not about saying I should not react with resistance to circumstance because that um, response or reaction is not voluntary. It is dragged out of us by life being a certain way and by the psychological identity being a certain way or the person being a certain way. Um, the person is not just the psychological identity. The person is the entirety of the human being and if that psychological identity exists as part of the person, which it does because, um, it, for, for most of us it does, because that is what develops as part of the growth of the human being. If that is there, then it's forced to resist life. It's forced to be attached to circumstance. So there's no question of, sh I should or I shouldn't feel suffering. I should or I shouldn't blame. I should or I shouldn't feel shame. I should or I shouldn't feel pride. I should or I shouldn't expect things. Um, or I should or I shouldn't feel worry and anxiety. So all of those are different forms of suffering. And, you know, the, the notion that I shouldn't feel that is in itself a form of um, suffering on the basis that I, the person, can choose how to respond. And that um, belief is in place when it isn't clear to us that that response is a happening. It's a happening because of the way that we're designed. So we can't expect it to be different. You don't expect the toaster to wash the dishes. 
because it's not designed to wash dishes, it's designed to make toast. So when toast um, is produced by the toaster, we go, that's exactly what I would expect. And in the same way, if the psychological identity has been formed by life and is in place, then when suffering arises, we go, that's exactly what I would expect. So if that can become part of our understanding in the same system that um, reacts with guilt and blame and all the different forms of suffering, at least then a part of our system will be getting involved in circumstance and that's understandable because the beliefs of doership and attachment are in place. And yet if a bit of our system can understand, oh, that makes complete sense. That's like the toaster producing toast. So instead of going, hey, why, why are you producing this suffering? You go, well, there's a psychological identity in place that I didn't put in place, life put in place. So the question, why are you producing psychological suffering, um, might not make sense to us at some point, where we realize that the psychological suffering is just a byproduct of a toaster. At least the, the analogy is that it is the byproduct of the instrument, just like toast is a byproduct of the toaster. That, if it sinks in, is by default a deep understanding of non doership. the seeing of suffering arising and understanding that is what the psychological identity produces. And the psychological identity is just a type of complex wiring in the body-mind organism. And the body-mind organism was wired by life. So we look at suffering and we can look at it and say, of course, Suffering is happening because life wired the, the body-mind organism, the human being, um, to include the belief of doership and attachment to outcome. And so suffering has to arise, which means suffering is being produced by life, not by the person. The person is a product of life. And the suffering is a product of the person, which really means the suffering is a product of life. the belief in personal doership doesn't see that the person is a product of life and doesn't see that the suffering is a product of a biological instrument shaped to produce certain things. The personal belief of personal doership says, oh, I did that and I shouldn't function like that. That's it. That That's... Um, that's the difference between the belief in personal doership and the falling away of the belief in personal doership. So another way that um, some teachings essentially um, try to break the um, belief of personal doership is by describing how things happen differently. So before I go into um, showing how a different teaching will describe where the suffering comes from differently, it will describe it differently, and yet hopefully you'll see that the attempt in describing it differently is to diminish the capacity of the um, attitude of doership towards the suffering being there. So before I describe how some other teachings describe the arising of suffering, um, I'll point out that what can make it easier for us to understand that I'm not the doer is to realize that thoughts arise and we, the part of us that is aware of life, is aware of the thoughts only after they present just in the same way as if 
um, someone comes up to you and has their hand behind their back with a bunch of flowers in their hand, and they're hiding the flowers behind their back, you aren't aware of the flowers. And as soon as they bring their arm out from behind the back and they hold the flowers out in front of you, you, can, you are then aware of the flowers. So first the flowers appear, and then there is awareness of them. And I don't mean by, when I say awareness of them, I don't mean the thought that says, oh, what a beautiful bunch of flowers. Now I'm aware of them. What a beautiful bunch of flowers. That is secondary. That comes after the awareness of the flowers, then some thinking about what we're aware of might happen. Just the fact that the flowers come into a f our field of consciousness or field of awareness, and once they arise, they appear as an object, it is at that point that we can say, I am aware, or there is awareness of the object. We can't see the flowers, we can't be aware of the flowers, so not, not so much seeing with the eyes, but there isn't awareness of the flowers before they present, before they manifest. There is awareness slightly after they manifest. And the same, same with speaking. Um, the speaking happens and we are aware of it after the speaking happens. The speaking, the sound, essentially is an object arising in the present moment. And um, in this teaching, we can, from one angle, describe the speaking as a result of the body's genes and up-to-date conditioning, part of the very complex overall structure of the human being. So I describe the belief of doership and attachment to outcome as a particular wiring of the human being. And there's lots of other wiring um, that makes up the human being. And uh, one way that we generically describe that very complex structure is by saying genes and up-to-date conditioning. The genes are the genetic blueprint that grows into the biological instrument it turns into eyes and ears and the brain and the skin and all of the different senses and um, functions of the body, the heart and the liver and the lungs, the hair, the fingernails, the eye color, the compl everything to do with the human being on a structural basis, we can say is a result of the genetic blueprint having uh, formed when the sperm and the egg come together, and then that genetic blueprint growing. And that instrument that is growing is never growing in an insulated environment. It is growing completely affected by whatever life throws at it, which we can call new conditioning in each moment. And so then we can look at the human being as a result of the genes and up-to-date conditioning. So it is a product of life. The human being is a product of life. Um, now, the brain is part of that um, machinery, and we can talk about wiring in the brain, if is one way of saying the brain is wired a certain way and then functions according to its wiring. And then there are obviously many other structures other than the brain, the heart, for example, and so we might not use the word wired for the heart, but it's, it's been grown um, and has a certain shape and um, way of functioning. So overall, the human being has been um, grown by life and the brain is part of that uh, human instrument. And we can use the word wiring for the brain because um, it seems to be a very complex network of neural pathways. So wiring seems appropriate. Um, and the, the belief of personal doership and attachment to outcome is part of that wiring of the brain. And so the attitude of doership and attachment to outcome is a movement essentially of the brain, a movement of thought, as described in this particular framework. And then a lot of other 
components of the human being, let's say whether we have a um, are prone to having back aches, for example, is a result of um, other structural parts of the genes and up-to-date conditioning. So none of the things that happen through the human being are our doing, but all part of the um, functioning of this very complex body-mind organism. And so thoughts arise as an object, essentially, and awareness becomes aware of the thought after it presents. Emotions arise and awareness, the awareness aspect of the human being, um, becomes aware of the emotion after it arises. And if suffering arises, if blame arises, which is, um, uh, a, a, it's, a, it's essentially, it's a, a feeling, but heavily influenced by thinking, um, then the suffering, the blame, the, the contraction becomes known after it comes into existence. So we're often encouraged to know the part of the human being, the aspect of the human being that is what we could describe as more true, more real. And on what basis is it described as more true, more real? It's if we find the conscious aspect of the human being, the, the part that feels like, oh, I am, I exist, um, and I'm aware, that part of the human being is not the thinking, it's not the emotions, it's not the body, it's this formless awareness. Um, and what we might start to realize, if it's described, we might start to see our own experience, because all these descriptions are just pointing to your own experience, for you to um, maybe feel it, see it, recognize it in different ways to before, because attention might not have landed on it before. But now that it's described, you might find attention going there. Um, so why is this part of the human being described as more real, more true, and hence we're encouraged to know that more than we tend to, to ground into that more than we tend to. So ground into what you really are, what your true nature is. And the reason it's described as your true nature is that firstly, if you took that away, the whole life experience collapses. So that's a very, it, it's sort of what you could call the lowest common denominator of the human being. If you lose a finger, the human being still is. If you take consciousness away, there's no experience of life. So consciousness is, you could say, more fundamental than a finger. Um, and there are various thought experiments you can do. You can imagine no arms and no legs, and yet I still am because the consciousness is still there. So the body um, is less fundamental, you could say, in terms of the human experience than consciousness and awareness. Furthermore, you can start to see the, the body is always changing and evolving. It basically from the time it um, is born, it starts getting old. It's always getting older and um, developing, but at a certain point it starts to <clears throat> um, diminish in capacity and in capability. And the same with thoughts and emotions, they arise and then they subside, they're always changing. And so they're there one minute and then they're gone. So these things that are changing, never constant, are less real than that which is always aware of them, always witnessing them. It is described as unchanging, ever present. Because if we start to see thoughts as objects produced by the um, brain, by the complex wiring that essentially is a machine, and we realize I only get to see the thought after it arises, That when I say I, I as that awareness, that 
only gets to see the flowers after they appear in the moment. And that witnessing awareness feels hunger after it arises. Not long after, but the feeling has to be there. And then we say, oh, now I'm aware of my hunger. I'm aware of my thought. What is aware? What is aware is this formless awareness aspect of the human being that becomes aware of things as they present in the moment. And so thinking presents in the moment and then we're aware of it. The body presents in the moment and then we're aware of it. A pain in the shoulder will suddenly present and we're aware of it. A headache is not there one moment and then it's there. And we're aware of it after it's there. So that which we are that is non, not changing, that is always aware of whatever there is, that part is the awareness or consciousness aspect of the human being. It's ever present in life. It has to be present in life because otherwise life wouldn't be experienced. It is the part of the human being that um, includes the I exist aspect, the, the sense I am, I exist. And it includes the part of the human being that is aware of whatever arises in the moment. So if a bird flies past, there is awareness of the bird. Now, if we haven't understood, we haven't not just understood with our intellect, but if we haven't come to get a sense and experience of the fact that the awareness aspect is aware of the body, is aware of the thoughts, is aware of the emotions, then um, what tends to happen is the awareness aspect um, is not known independent of the body and the thoughts and the emotions. So there is no space, no separation between the objects and the awareness. They become infused and therefore the experience is that the body is aware of <coughs> um, the bird, for example. Whereas when we start to see that the awareness is that which is aware of the body, and the awareness is that which is aware of the thoughts and aware of the feelings, then it might also become apparent that the awareness is not only aware of the body and the thoughts and the feelings, but also aware of the tree and the cars and the other people and the bird. We can rest there and be aware of life happening. Not as my doing, because we now know ourselves as that formless awareness witnessing even the body. So the body is a very intelligent instrument that will, <coughs> after eating, pick up the dishes, take them to the sink, wash them or put them in the dishwasher, will put the spices back in the cupboard, will wipe the counter, will tie up the trash bag and take it out to the bin. And that's not anyone's doing. That is the functioning of the very complex, intelligent instrument, the, the biological organism, the body-mind organism. And the awareness aspect of the human being can witness, can watch the body washing the plates, putting the cups back in the cupboard, putting the spices back in the cupboard, wiping down the counter, tying up the bag, the body walking outside because its intelligence knows where the bin is and lifting up the lid and putting the bag in the bin and putting the lid down. All of that can be witnessed as a happening, a happening according to life, a happening according to God's will, a happening according to source. We can say source is living the body, 
Source is moving the body. Life is moving the body. Now, why do we say life is moving the body? Because if we look at it, the the body is a result of the sperm and the egg coming together. Now, where did the sperm and the egg come from? They came from life. They were an expression. They are part of life in specific form. Um, and so once the sperm and the egg come together, that is still life, and it turns into a different form, into this body. So this body is essentially an expression of life force, life energy. And the parents, too, are expressions of life. They have been um, extracted or um, molded, extruded out of life energy. So the, the human is just life energy in a particular form. The tree is life energy in a particular form. The bird is life energy in a particular form. It's all coming from life energy. Or source is another um, ideal way to describe it. Because source doesn't um, create an object. Um, so even when we say life energy... It might, our idea of life might be something specific. It might be harder for us to understand what it means when we say, I am an expression of life. Um, because essentially, the human being is part of life as we know it. So if you say source, source energy has turned into all of life. We don't really need to know what source is, but we can at least. Um, theoretically say, okay, well, I know that life exists, and so source has become life, and then the body has, is, a, is a subset of life. So life is moving, this has created essentially an intelligent biological and psychological um, organism that knows what to do with the kitchen counter and with the dirty plates and with the garbage and with the spices and with the frying pan and the stove. And we're so, there, there is a belief that's been put in place that says, I, as some entity, th this belief says, I am the entity making the counter cleaning happen. Whereas in fact, the counter-cleaning is happening as a result of the complexity of the body, just like a thought happens. And what you, you really are is the one witnessing all of that happening. And if that witnessing, if that understanding that the dishwashing is happening automatically because of an intelligence that life has put in place, that doesn't require um, a doer to happen, it is happening just like the thoughts are happening as a result of that complexity. And what I am is that silent awareness that witnesses it all happening. And it, if the intellect can start to grasp, oh, all of those movements that I've spent my whole life thinking are my doing, are movements that are happening, going to happen anyway, because of the specific design of the body-mind, which is life in very specific form, so it's intelligence in form. And so that is happening. All of that is happening and doesn't require a doer. And this can become experientially known or sensed when so many of the movements in life are described as happenings, described as automatic and not created by that which is witnessing them. So that's why I'm harboring, laboring this point um, that the flowers arise and that's when awareness becomes aware of them. Thoughts arise, and that's when awareness becomes aware of them. Movements in the body, an itch happens, and that's when awareness becomes aware of the itch. And then the intelligence of the body, 
knows if there's an itch, scratch it. It doesn't require a doer to do that. The intelligence of the body knows to do that. And the witnessing will watch the scratching of an itch happen. Now, previously, there's been no sense of what I am witnessing things after they happen. What has happened as part of our development is that which I am becomes morphed um, psychologically. It, there is an identification with the happenings of life. And then the assumption is that's my doing. I did that. It wouldn't have happened without me. The teaching says it would have happened according to God's will. It's always happening according to God's will. There is no doer. And even the morphing, the involvement in what is happening as if it is my doing is also God's will. That too is not a doing, but rather a result of the wiring in the body-mind organism that creates a thought that says, I did that. And when in that particular thought is what attracts and forces um, awareness into, a, uh, into a, a form where awareness is not aware of itself as the witness. So it's all a divine play of consciousness or a divine play of life. The identification with the body and everything that happens through the body is my doing is part of this play of life. Life is, is designed to be like this. The suffering is part of life. And then the liberation from suffering as that starts to happen for people, is also part of the story of life. And because it's part of the story of life, life needs to include new conditioning, new descriptions of life as part of the story of life in order to um, allow the changes to happen, in order for the changes to make sense. Because this story of life as it's designed is not some random story where things just happen. It's a story of cause and effect. So whenever something happens in life, you look at life and there is a reason for it having happened. A plane falls out of the sky, not for no reason, but because the engine stops working or the computer stops working. And sometimes a plane falls out of the sky and we say, there's no reason for it. There, there is a reason, we just don't haven't found out what it was because the, um, the evidence is gone, for example. Or um, some dynamics happen that we don't understand um, and those dynamics are the reason for it, but we haven't understu understood those dynamics yet. So we don't see. And so what, is called, what are called miracles are happenings that we don't have an explanation for. I suggest that all of life has a causal explanation. Now, the, the, the causality of life doesn't mean it's not mystical. Um, there can be causes that we don't understand. Um, and so then those causes that we don't understand and don't see, um, when the outcome is, is registered, in life, we say, oh, that's a miracle. So my suggestion is that this story of life is a story of cause and effect, even if just on the surface. We can't deny that there is always um, the causal component that explains something that happens as a result of a sequence of causality. And so if this is a story of liberation, the story will include causality that explains, that um, can justify the end of suffering. And when we look at suffering, we see that the suffering is based on a certain attitude to life, the attitude we can call doership and attachment to outcome. And that attitude is based on life having delivered certain 
up-to-date conditioning or certain new conditioning that has turned into our up-to-date conditioning that turns into the attitude. And so life put in place that up-to-date conditioning by delivering new conditioning moment after moment after moment. And at a certain time, life starts delivering a specific type of new conditioning, a description of life that isn't the description that we are generally exposed to until we start being on a seeking path. And that new conditioning can radically change our up-to-date conditioning. And we can start to know aspects of ourselves that were unseen before. Certain belief structures can collapse. And as a result of that change, we might find that suffering starts to diminish. And when suffering ends, what we can say is that is peace of mind in daily living. So even if, um, you know, some <coughs> teachings might say, you know, the end of suffering has nothing to do with changes on the level of the body-mind organism. The end of suffering has nothing to do with um, the intellect has nothing to do with thinking. Um, and I understand why that methodology is put forward. Um, it's quite possible that some people putting forward the, the methodology haven't actually seen and... Um, understood intellectually, so haven't been able to put an accurate concept on what has actually changed for them. That's quite possible for the misunderstanding that leads to suffering. That misunderstanding can be largely undone, and therefore there will be peace of mind. And yet there can still be a lack of um, being able to describe or to know what has happened um, and on the one hand, it's like, who cares if, um, if the misunderstanding that leads to suffering has changed, then being able to know what has happened is not really that important. As long as the suffering has come to an end, then it's like, well, as long as we realize we're looking for peace of mind and we can feel that there is peace of mind, and I'm not seeking anything because there's no uncomfortableness driving the seeking. So at some point we say, that's it. And we'll describe it um, based on how we understand what has happened and what the changes are. And those descriptions will be based on how what we feel, let's say, what we feel the changes to have been. And so when suffering um, comes to an end, it doesn't. it isn't because we actively do something, it's because the wiring gets changed and then the suffering doesn't get produced. So it's very possible for a teacher to say, look, this has nothing to do with your intellect. It's just that one day suffering stopped happening. And I didn't do anything. I didn't think my way to the end of suffering. And so what they're arguing or what they're describing is not actually the fact that the end of suffering has nothing to do with thinking. If, they, if that's what they're saying, it has nothing to do with thinking, they're actually wrong. Um, what they're saying is, I didn't do a set of thinking that um, clearly changed um, the suffering from being there to not being there. It was a mysterious process. And if anything, um, some people would say, what I, how I'm going to describe it is that life is spontaneously arising in each moment. And at some point, there was the awareness that what I am is not the body, for example. And suffering just stopped arising. And it's just part of what is magically arising in life as the experience of each moment. And it's got nothing to do with thinking. It's just that life created some, some different experience where, or different way of living where there's no suffering. Um, 
and that's fair enough. That's um, the, the teaching coming through them in a particular way, and it can be very powerful. I'll, I'll, so I'm leading into what I was getting at earlier on. If we, r if that person, the teacher, um, is guided to say, okay, I'm not. Let, let's really see what the difference in is between then and now. Would you not agree that before um, there was a whole lot of thinking about the past, um, feeling ashamed about things that we might have done that were embarrassing, looking back at how we um, uh, partook in a job that we had and realizing that actually we weren't very successful at the job. And there might be a looking back in the past, a looking back on the past and feeling ashamed, feeling um, hurt, worried about what the other people think about us. And all of that uncomfortable feeling um, is what we could call suffering. When we look at it, it's, it's a type of thinking. It's thinking about the past. It's remembering um, and focusing on a three-year period where you produced maybe not very uh, work you're not very proud of. And continually feeling that that is who you are. I'm the failure. And, and then seeking happens, uh, whatever that process is. And then there's peace of mind. I say, so what is this peace of mind? Or they might not even describe it as peace of mind. Right? They'll say, it's about knowing myself. I say, okay, so knowing yourself, what's the important of, importance of knowing yourself? And, well, I know myself as the formless awareness. I'm not the body. I'm not the thinking. Right. And what practical difference does it make to know yourself and to know you're not the body and you're not the thinking? Oh, well, I'm not, I, there isn't an identification with the thoughts. Right. And so if there isn't an identification with the thoughts, um, what then happens to the experience. Oh, so if there are n thoughts of shame, there is a witnessing of those. So the thoughts are there and I don't um, <clears throat> feel like that is who I am, right? Okay, so doesn't that, isn't that less uncomfortable um, than when you are identified with the thoughts? Yes, it's less so can't we say that that is less suffering than um, before. Yes, so in practical terms, isn't the benefit of knowing yourself differently the fact that the experience changes? Yes, so is it about knowing yourself or is it about the fact that suffering is getting less? Okay, so at least it's both. Um, we have to say, well, I guess the consequence of knowing yourself differently means the suffering feels different. Then isn't it true that as the process goes on that even the primary suffering that is for a while witnessed can come to an end and now there isn't even the need to witness this shame. Even the shame can come to an end um, in this process, this magical process that we don't know how it works and it's got nothing to do with thinking. Yes, there can be um, the end of the shame and even the witnessing then becomes not so important because there's nothing to need to witness. There's no uncomfortable feeling that we need to be separated from. So really the movement is towards this, it can be described as spaciousness, stillness, isn't that spaciousness and stillness because a certain type of thinking that used to be very prevalent is no longer prevalent? Um, isn't that your experience, really, that these thoughts that used to plague us, thoughts about what life is all about, thoughts about um, uh, what my purpose in life is and feeling uncomfortable that... Um, uh, <coughs> that you know, I'm not fulfilling my destiny. When life starts to be known differently, all of this type of thinking falls away. Like the, the, the notion of finding one's purpose falls away as we find ourselves comfortable in the present moment. And then if we spend the day sitting on the couch, there's comfortableness. And so there's no sense, oh, 
I need to find a purpose. We, we realize sitting on the couch is my purpose. When uncomfortableness is there, then it seems like sitting on the couch is the problem. So my point being is as we look at it um, really closely and say, what is the difference? We'll find that what has changed is our thinking, our way of relating to those um, things that happened in the past. And the way of relating to them, even if we say, well, it's not about change thinking it's now that they're just witnessed as thoughts arising yeah but before when there was the involvement in it wasn't the involvement actually because of a layer of thinking that was creating the dragging into uh, and the sense of being involved and i i suggest that's what it is so um the movement in my mind in my way of seeing it is that the change that happens is a change of how we think, how we think about the past and the future. Um, and in that changed thinking, the sense of who we are um, falls, a specific sense of who we are falls away. And what is revealed is a way of being human that feels very different when certain thinking isn't there. So the change to me is about a change in our thinking. That is a thinking towards all of the things that have happened in the past and might happen in the future. A type of thinking towards what other people think about us. Where it's like, who cares? Would be the new, it's not even a thought, who cares? It's about resting and f and the only reason the resting happens there is because that thinking isn't happening. So let's go back to this, um, where I, I went off into this deviation. I was, going to, I was talking about how we can start to witness thoughts arising. And the description I was giving before is the thoughts arise because they are an output of a very complex body-mind organism that is designed by life to produce thoughts. And the belief in personal doership doesn't see the thought as arising first, not as my doing, but as an object that just arises. The belief in personal doership is identified with the thought and says, that is who I am. That is my doing. And if we can describe the body-mind organism is a very complex machine that produces thoughts, just like a toaster produces toast, or a cookie machine produces cookies. If we can describe the body-mind organism like that and point out that awareness only becomes aware of thoughts after they arise, only becomes aware of emotions after they arise, only becomes aware of feelings of hunger, of tiredness, of irritability after they arise, so then we can start to know ourselves as the witness aware of the biological and psychological movements that are happening according to the complex body-mind organism. Now another teaching will say, to avoid a certain confusion, thoughts, emotions do not come from a complex body-mind organism. Thoughts and emotions don't come from a brain. Thoughts and emotions are not part of a wiring structure or a genes and up-to-date conditioning. That is a concept and it's what keeps you um, identified with the body-mind organism. Um, not, not talking about this teaching and saying that, but saying when you believe in causality which is how life has conditioned you from a young age, that leads to suffering. Don't believe any of those ways of seeing life. Um, the, that teaching will say thoughts arise out of nothing and subside back into nothing. Emotions arise out of nothing and subside back into nothing. And they will invite you to go to your experience. Close your eyes and feel, 
and wait for the next thought to arise and you'll see that you don't know what the next thought is going to be. And it will arise in this vast space of nothingness. And if you're really present with the experience, you'll say that I can't tell you that it came from a brain that is wired a certain way. You see, you see, the brain is just a concept. You don't have a brain. You are the space that is aware of the thoughts that come out of nothing and the thoughts that then subside back into nothing. So it can seem like the two teachings are arguing with each other. One says, no, the thoughts come out of um, your genes and up-to-date conditioning. And the other one says, don't be ridiculous. There is no such thing as genes and up-to-date conditioning. There is no such thing as a brain. Your thoughts come out of nothing and your emotions come out of nothing. And the body movement, the speaking, comes out of nothing and subsides back into nothing. And it can seem like, oh, we have to have an argument about this because... Clearly, one of us is right and one of us is wrong. I say, no, don't get into an argument about that. That's a methodology. Who cares about that, really? When you look at what is really important, it's the end of suffering. Those descriptions are not the truth. They are mm, relative descriptions about... It's a, it's a concept or a theory about how what is, is. And one of them might seem to be um, much less conceptual because the one that says it comes out of nothing says I'm not holding on to any concepts because you're the one that's talking about brains and thoughts coming from brains that's a concept you can't confirm that when, you, when we say it comes out of nothing that's not a concept that's the truth so well just because you can't be aware of a brain and a thought just arises in experience that's true that's what happens doesn't mean it doesn't come from a brain. It doesn't mean that because you're not aware of a brain, there isn't a brain. So that too is a concept. They're both concepts. You know, the concept that comes out of nothing and subsides into nothing may actually be wrong because maybe it comes from a brain. Maybe it's both. I think it's probably both. Um, and so let's be clear that the... the the ground that some someone might stand on and say no if you go to your own experience you'll see you don't have a brain and your experience isn't telling you the truth so you can't rely on the fact that a thought arises and you have no reference of a brain as meaning that that is absolutely true that thoughts come out of nothing but this is not the main point we're getting to the main point. So as I was saying, we don't need to argue about which of those is correct. What we need to see is that in putting forward the concept that a thought arises out of nothing and subsides back into nothing, which we might find hard to um, have a frame of reference for, but if you find meditation happening and you are still and your attention comes to this vast open space and becomes very present with the present moment and you realize that if I'm honest with the present moment there is no experience of a body there is no experience of an external world there is no experience of time and space anymore if there is presence with present with the closed eye meditation space and then in that space we might feel, so feel what is there. And you might say, okay, there's a sensation of sadness. And as that sadness is, is um, felt, meaning attention is on it, we might feel that it morphs and it might dissolve. And so now it's, it's not there, it's dissolved back into nothing. And then a thought might arise and awareness becomes aware of the thought. Now, where did it come from? In, in, in experience, in the meditation state, it, one minute it wasn't there, and the next minute it arose out of the nothing that is there. So the thought in practice comes out of nothing, 
and subsides back into nothing. An emotion arises out of nothing and subsides back into nothing. An itch arises out of nothing and subsides back into no nothing. And the scratch is a sensation that wasn't there one moment and arises in experience and then subsides. A sound arises out of the empty space. So if a bird chirps or a, there is a barking sound or a horn sound, it's not there, then it arises and then it subsides. All of this is there to emphasize that the objects of experience and in a meditation experience, it can be easier to become aware of specific objects of experience, primarily thoughts, sounds, emotions, because there is much less clutter of objective, of objective experience. With eyes open, there's many more components or layers of experience, so it can be harder to see the thought. But in the meditation experience, the thought can become seen more easily as being there like a cloud in the sky, coming and going. And the main point there is to be the witness that is, a, that is witnessing, that becomes aware of the object when it arises and when the object subsides, then awareness is no longer aware of the object. And the shift that is being encouraged in that is a shift of seeing these objects as happenings. So in one teaching, the happening is described as a result of the genes and up-to-date conditioning functioning automatically. And a thought arises as a happening. You know, not anyone's doing, but a product of life. And in the other description, the thought arises out of nothing. Now, the it's not really important whether the thought comes from genes and up-to-date conditioning or whether it comes out of nothing. What's important is to see that both of them are suggesting that the thoughts are impersonal movements, not anyone's doing. And it's coming to see those objects that we have identified with as impersonal movements that creates a disidentification with them. And in an instant, we might realize, oh, I simply cannot be the doer, or oh, what I am is not the body, what I am is not the thoughts, what I am is not the emotions. So if next time the washing is happening, maybe a witnessing of the washing of the plates from the perspective of seeing that the grabbing of the dishwashing liquid is all happening because of a very intelligent body-mind organism that knows how to, on its own, wash plates and put things away and wipe counters down. And in that moment, it could be, wow, for my whole life, there has been the identification with those movements as my doing. And it might be very hilarious to realize that for a whole lifetime there has been an interpretation of something that has been happening as a result of a biological robot, a biological instrument created by life to function exactly the way it functions in each moment. And for our whole life there has been a claiming ownership over that. This is how the understanding becomes deeper and deeper and deeper, how it moves from being an intellectual understanding, which an intellectual understanding means, okay, there is, I understand what you're saying, that I'm not the doer because um, everything is a happening according to God's will and not my doing, that whatever I do is a happening according to God's will in the form of genes and up-to-date conditioning. 
So someone might say, I understand it intellectually, but I just don't get it. I don't really feel it. Um, and there's a word that is very nice called apperception. To apperceive something is to um, know it beyond the intellect, where you know it in action, where you see it in action, where you are conscious of what is happening. Um, and in that moment of apperceiving the truth or apperceiving the reality as it's described, that's when the intellectual understanding goes deeper and it's, there's a, a realization, oh, the moving of the body-mind organism is the moving of a very intelligent... Now, intelligent doesn't... Um, depends how we use the word. doesn't mean the in intelligence has to belong to an, a doer. Intelligence is built into the structure of life. And so that's often um, one of the things that prevents us from seeing the automatic happening because we assume intelligence belongs to a me. Whereas intelligence is built into biological organisms. And then we can realize, oh, the speaking is happening because of intelligence that isn't my intelligence, but is the intelligence of the body-mind organism. So speaking is happening. Eating is happening. Meditating is happening. Life is happening. Life is a happening. Life is this big dance of intelligence, impersonal intelligence, not the intelligence of a doer that makes things happen. So this understanding needs to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So hearing the descriptions um, will, in time, God willing, lead to a seeing of more and more of the functioning of the human being, more and more of the movement of life as a happening and not my doing. As we find ourselves going through life, still getting in the car to go to work, which is all happening according to our destiny. Um, turning on the key, in that moment, the turning of the key might be witnessed as, oh, that's, that's the biological intelligence of the body-mind organism that has learned as a result of new conditioning being delivered to it moment after moment, how a car works. And the more and more that the thinking, especially the thinking, is seen as a happening, the more and more effortless witnessing of everything as a happening sets in. And at some point, a spontaneous realization, I simply cannot be the doer, which is really the realization everything, the blaming, if the blaming is happening, is a happening according to my genes and up-to-date conditioning. I simply cannot be the, the doer. The other simply cannot be the doer. And then this load of guilt and blame, of pride, expectation, worry that we've carried around our whole life collapses because we'll see that this load of guilt and shame and blame and hatred is all based on seeing the other as the doer, seeing myself as the doer, seeing those actions that happened that weren't so favorable and saying, oh, that was my doing and I have to hate myself for being so flawed. I have to hate the other for being so cruel. How could they do that to me? And in this moment, I simply cannot be the doer. The other simply cannot be the doer. Then this hatred falls away. The, who is there to hate? There's a realization that life is hating life. 
life was hating life because life inserted this belief in personal doership which created essentially uh, identification with a, a particular body-mind organism with name and form and imagined that name and form to be independent and insulated from life meaning not part of life separated from life not connected to life and that's that's the disconnection that we feel that's the aloneness that we feel that's the uncomfortableness that we feel is a feeling of disconnection of separateness and when we see ourselves as separate the other is separate then we have to feel suspicion rivalry competition towards the other seeing the other as someone who can take away my happiness in any moment can deliver pain to me this change of attitude sees that the other is just an instrument through which life is functioning this body mind organism is an instrument through which life is functioning and if the other delivers pain it's because the story of life the destiny of life is designed for that to happen and it's my destiny for that pain to have been delivered and the destiny of the other to be the instrument through which the pain is delivered and similarly if it's my destiny to experience pleasure then life may use the other to deliver pleasure and deep down there is the connectedness to one's core that reveals for itself by itself it's self-confirming that my essence is not dependent doesn't come into existence because pleasure or pain is delivered to me and that's um that that movement into um disidentification with what happens in the flow of life because we see everything as a happening means a resting in a part of the human being that we didn't rest in before and that resting is really means that the human being has been reshaped such that the experience of life is different and now there is the capacity for the human experience to include what we call resting in being and i would say it's the human being has changed such that the thinking such that the attitude towards life is very different and we know ourselves differently and we experience life differently peace of mind and daily living so i want i'm excited for people to be engaging and coming along on this journey and the more that i feel people are um signing in and listening each morning um is even without an attachment to outcome knowing that um you know whether anyone's listening or not um that's not what will determine uh someone's my happiness but when this is the way life unfolds circumstantially it's also very pleasing to see that the change that um life delivered for me is now something that life is using this body mind organism as an instrument to deliver the same conditioning with its unique flavor to whoever else is destined to find themselves with the enthusiasm to join in and to listen i know i talk a lot <laughs> i get um some messages uh saying i shouldn't prattle on um as much as i do and be more concise and not um yeah prattle on but uh who knows what's needed um so it's exciting i feel i feel excited to to notice that um this new conditioning is actually being received by many people and hopefully um that then starts leading to this change that happens without us knowing without us doing the change it just one day we realize the relationship to life the attitude to what happens in life is different and as a result the sense of self the um 
uncomfortableness, the contraction, the suffering is absent. And it really is about like waking up one day and saying things, life is different. I don't know how it's different. I, or I, I, maybe you, I know how it's like not filled with this uncomfortableness. I find that I'm happy to be moved through the day without any specific agenda, without any sense of needing to go anywhere because the uncomfortableness that was driving uh, seeking for something different, because uncomfortableness in the present moment is very hard to be with. So it drives a movement that says, oh, there must be something out there because what's here is not acceptable. And so the dissolving of that means a completely different way of um, living life. Sitting on the couch when there is no suffering is seen to be a completely valid way of living life. When there's suffering, no matter what you do, it doesn't seem valid. It doesn't seem appropriate. So we're always looking for the the thing that I'm I haven't bumped into yet that will be valid, that will feel valid, without realizing that it's the suffering, it's the uncomfortableness, which is always an attitude to life, which is really stemming from an idea or a false idea of who we are, without realizing it that it's that attitude that needs to fall away. And then the circumstance, however it is, is irrelevant. And what is really relevant is the fact that we feel at ease in life. So we'll uh, see if there's some questions. Uh, hi, Laurent. Hello, Laurent. So we're just trying to solve a sound issue so I can hear the questioner and we'll, um, we'll be back shortly. So in the meantime, I'll just uh, mention something that is another small nuance that um, we might not realize. Um, and that is that the teaching says that the suffering is always going to be our own suffering. It's based on how we interpret the flow of life. So the guilt, the blame, the pride, the worry, the expectation. So if someone is judging you, if someone is blaming you, their blame towards you is their suffering. 
um, the blame that they have seeing you as the doer and telling you that you're not doing a good enough job um, is if it is judgment, if it is coming with doership from their um, way of seeing life, then that is their suffering. What that is delivering to you in the moment is pain in the moment. They might say, I don't like the way you're doing this. They might say, you're not very good at this. Um, they might even say, you're stupid. And so obviously that's not what we want to hear. It's not our preference. <clears throat> However, it's pain in the moment. It turns into suffering, not because the other person is blaming us, but rather because the pain in the moment, which in this case is the other person's anger or disappointment with us or blame towards us, is received as pain in the moment and then our attachment to life being pleasure, pleasure, pleasure turns, or our attitude of doership, turns that statement, that circumstance, into something that we suffer about. So it turns the um, blame from the other into something that we either believe and we say, oh, I'm not good enough because they're telling me I'm not good enough. And then we believe I'm not good enough. And so we feel guilt. We feel shame. Or we receive the pain, which is the blame from the other. It's pain. And we say, you shouldn't be acting this way. You shouldn't be functioning this way. You should be functioning differently. You hurt me. I hate you. And so we might think that the other causes us to suffer. The other, if they are um, blaming us, that's their own suffering. It turns into our suffering, not because they're blaming us, because, but rather because of our own internal attitude of doership and attachment to outcome. If our happiness um, was dependent on the other not blaming us because we say if you blame me or if you judge me if you call me stupid then that's creating suffering for me no then we're missing the point um, their blame for us their judgment of us them being derogatory to us is just pleasure or pain in the moment and it's if we resist the pain and insist that that pain not be there that it's turned into our suffering. If we believe um, that what they say, like you're no good at this, you're no good at life, and we believe it, then it turns into suffering. It's like, and that is our own sense of I'm not good enough, not the other person's sense of I'm not good enough. If I feel I am a perfectly valid human being, if that's my sense of self, I'm a perfectly valid human being. But I understand that as a perfectly valid human being, I'm going to have some shortcomings and some strong points. And so if I know I'm a perfectly valid human being, even if my cooking skills are not very good. And so if someone eats a meal and says to me, you know, this is really pathetic. How can you possibly um, produce such an um, ordinary meal? You know, I've been training you in cooking for a year and you produce this rubbish. And that is not the cause of my suffering. If my sense of self is um, sure of itself, if my sense of self is, I am, I am, and my I amness is my validity. Now, whether the, the body cooks well or not, that's, that's just my um, shortcomings or my good points. So when someone says, you know, you're a lousy cook, either they, they could be mistaken and they're having a bad day or they just have very specific preferences and many other people say, you're a great cook. So either they're mistaken and you know that actually I'm not a bad cook but they don't like the way I cook. Or you might say, Actually, I know I'm pretty rubbish at cooking, but I 
don't think that that makes me invalid as a human being. I don't feel invalid as a human being. And so the point is, if you are connected to your beingness, criticism from the other doesn't turn into suffering. If you're not connected to your beingness, the core um, doership at the bottom of our psychological identity is essentially shame, which is a sense I am not good enough. And so the truth is that deep down there is this tendency for us to feel like we are not good enough. And when the other says, you know, you're really quite lousy, we go, I know, I know, I, that's what I believe about myself. And now you've just reminded me. Um, and so if we suffer, it's not because of what they have said, it's because of our own internal sense of self. Now, this um, can be tricky because it seems like what they say is the cause of my suffering. Because we don't, haven't really um, felt the dynamics um, closely enough. And so we take it on the surface and it seems if you didn't say that, I wouldn't feel so bad. So you hurt me, I hate you. Is what instead of realizing when the suffering comes up, ah, this is because of my own um, sense of self, my own beliefs of doership and attachment to outcome. And so to feel like I am not good enough, there has to be the sense I am the doer, because then we say, oh, it's my fault that I'm not good enough. I designed myself not good enough. I didn't do enough work to be good enough. When that belief in doership falls away, and someone says, you know, you're really not a good friend. You're really not a good cook. You're really not a good boyfriend or girlfriend. It, you might even go, I know. I agree. And find that your connection to your core is not lost there can be a, a, a I agree look I wish I was different or not I wish I was different I can see that if I was different on a biological and psychological level then yes I could please you more um, and it would be nice to please you more but the fact is that this is just not how I am and if we can relate to it like that, it means there's a clear distinction between the sense of self, the core, that doesn't have good sides and bad sides. It just is. It is undifferentiated. It doesn't have personality. It doesn't have preferences. It doesn't have age or gender. Um, it doesn't have good points or bad things. It is. And then we can look at the um, biological things and say, yes, you know, my hair's falling out. Um, my um, cooking skills are not great. My interhuman relationship skills are not great. And understand that, yes, um, it might be nice, it would be pleasurable for those shortcomings to change. And there's no reason to, um, when we accept and say, yes, it's true, it doesn't mean that we don't do what we can if we feel like it to improve those aspects of ourselves. But we have to realize that we're not in control of those things changing. And that objectivity says, yes, I know that's my shortcoming and these are my good points. And when a shortcoming leads to a, a outcome that is painful or a consequence that's painful, we go, yeah, that's obviously a result of my specific shortcoming. And you can say, I've tried to change it, I'm willing for it to change, and yet it hasn't changed. So let's see if uh, Laurent is still there waiting. Yes, hi Laurent. Yes, you can hear me? Yes, I can. Good. Uh, I've written the question, so I read it, it will be easier. Okay. So it's exciting what you said about uh, this sudden change in life and the disparation of suffering. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. um, but what's the goal of having an enlightened life or not, if after all this, all this is suppressed in death? And it seems that you say us, not sure, that this disparition of suffering could solve the existential question of death, but uh, how comes? Um, okay, so um, had you, I, I just need to clarify something. You say, um, yeah. uh, what is the point, I think you're saying, if all this goes away in de at death? Is that right? Yeah. Well, yes, because, you know, I am surprised, not only with you, but with um, many people who speak about non duality. Mm -hmm. You you teach us how to live better, how to live, uh, how to have better intelligence, better comprehension of life, stop suffering. Of course, that's wonderful. Everything is wonderful. And my question is, but at the end, uh, you will live a good life. Perhaps I will live a bad life. But it will be the same for both of us. Uh, Except in the end, yes. Something. Yeah. Um, but I'm not really. Um, I mean, the <clears throat> it's an interesting um, question because it means it's pointing at where is um, what the priority is, right? For um, from my point of view, so what what it's pointing at is that we are seeing it, seeing the priority or what's important quite differently. Um, from my point of view, we could focus on what's after life, thinking that that's important, and then completely miss um, what is here now. Um, and um, my view is to value what is here now and say, actually, this is what I know. This is life. Um, this is the only experience I have, really. Whether I'm going to have an experience after life is hearsay. Um, what I know of Roger is Roger is a combination of consciousness and the body-mind organism. So a lot of the personality, a lot of the preferences, um, and the, you know, the Rogerness aspect of my experience has a lot to do with the genes and up-to-date conditioning of the body. And so from what I've seen is that when we die, the body essentially disintegrates. Um, it's burnt or it's buried and it becomes dysfunctional, like an instrument that is you know, broken. It no longer works, um, which means the experience of Roger is not going to exist anymore. Um, and I, in practical terms, am Roger. So Roger is interested in happiness for Roger, not happiness for something else after life. I let that entity look after itself and find its own happiness. Um, so m my conclusion is that Roger isn't going to be there. There might be the soul or impersonal consciousness. Personally, when I've come to look at Roger um, and deconstruct Roger, I see that there won't be anything, um, or at least not that I say definitively there won't be anything after life, but I can say definitively I don't know if there will be anything or not. Um, when I look at what Roger is and I see that a large part of what Roger is won't be there after life, um, I come to the conclusion, if there is something after life, it's not Roger. Um, and so practically I say, what I'm interested in is happiness for Roger in this life. Not uh, happiness for some theoretical Roger in another life. Actually, I don't think there is going to be Roger in another life. Um, and I don't think there was Roger in a previous life either. There might have been John in a previous life, and there might be some link between John or Mary in a previous life linked to Roger's ex way of experiencing life now. 
But my conclusion is, okay, I have life now. This is the experience I have now. The spiritual teachings pointed out to me, they said, there is, life is suffering. This life, as we know it, is suffering. But this life can be free of suffering. And so the teaching isn't really trying to get you to be a better person. Definitely not saying you should be a kinder person or a um, more, you know, a be better cook or a better partner or anything like that. It's the teaching is really simply focusing on the change on the level that relates to suffering and 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 then peace of mind. Um, and that really is pointing at the sense that we have to realize that life is happening, that we are just moving. And so it's not something that we then do and we become a better person. Life makes us different, hopefully where there is no suffering. So in summary, my point is that the way I see it is to really value this life and um, essentially say that death is the end of the book for... for um, for Roger, anyway, death is the final chapter. And so life is all there is from the perspective of Roger. And Roger has become aware that life can either be a life of uncomfortableness, and then life showed that that uncomfortableness is about an attitude to life, the attitude changes, and the uncomfortableness goes away. So the difference is unhappy life to or happy life um, and so what happens w when when someone says well when you die all of that is irrelevant life is irrelevant whether you had a happy life or an unhappy life the two people one had a happy life the other had an unhappy life then death has come and life is essentially doesn't exist anymore so What's the point? The point is that, or the point as I put it, is that, well, even if it theoretically is not real because it won't carry on forever, in practice, it's all I have. So practically speaking, the best I can do is to live a happy life instead of an un unhappy life. But I do agree with your notion that when death comes, whether it was happy or unhappy, is irrelevant, which is a freedom in itself. It means even if one is having an unhappy life, we can know that at least death will be the relief from that. But the relief, because there's no one there. So the fact that, um, in a way, my happy life doesn't mean anything at death, it doesn't mean anything because there'll be no one there to, for it to mean anything to. Um, so, it's interesting, your, your question is interesting, and I hope my answer at least demonstrates my point of view. Uh, yes, no? You yeah. don't hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's written in Nizagadatta Maharaj, he, he was the master of your master. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote, uh, stop, believe you are born, and you will stop, believe you will, de you will die. Mm -hmm. And I am just, how could we consider in non duality something else than this? You, you understand my question? I, I understood your point of view, and I just underlined, according to me, there existed another According to you, there exists another point, point of, of view. Sure, yeah. Well, the point of view of the, the greatest interrogation about life is stop, believe you were born, you will stop, be afraid of death. And that's, it seems to be a part of non-duality, of the, of the teaching of non-duality. Mm -hmm. And sorry for saying this, but it seems that this part I cannot find it in your teaching, mm -hmm. or I missed something. 
Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> um, I think it, it very much is in the teaching, but it may not be presented in the same way. Um, like the, the talk today is sort of essentially pointing at um, finding that part of the human being that isn't physical, that isn't um, coming and going, that isn't born and then dies, the witness, the consciousness, the witness that is aware of the thoughts arising, that is aware of the emotions arising, that is aware of the changing story of life that comes and goes moment after moment. That is the part of the human being that has not been realized. And so um, Nisargadatta's teaching is that is saying, um, realize that you were never born and will never die or stop believing that you were born, which really means stop believing you are the body, is really there just to bring about a realization of an aspect of the human being that exists now um, in order for happiness now to happen. Um, so we can hear that, you know, stop believing that you were born and then you will stop believing that you die and no longer be afraid of death. We might think, oh, yes, that's, um, it's about, after death, or it's about not being afraid of death. Um, but in practical terms, not being afraid of death really means something. It means stop feeling like your happiness in life is dependent on life looking a certain way. It might, we might not realize that that's what stop being afraid of death means. Stop being afraid of death means don't be afraid to live. Um, and if that's not what we, if we if we don't realize that, we might keep thinking that it's about after death. Um, that what Nisargadatta is pointing about pointing to is life after death. Whereas I I don't think it's about that. I think it's about pointing to the aspect of the human being that is not dependent by what happens in the flow of life. And to realize then that our fear of death is a psychological fear of death. The doer doesn't want to imagine not being. The doer is, a, is, is petrified of the notion of not existing because um, that feels like the ultimate assault on the belief in doership and attachment to outcome. And it says, I haven't found my happiness. I haven't found my purpose in life. I can't die yet. You can't take life away from me. I'm still trying to figure life out. And so it's the doer that is psychologically afraid of death. So the fear of death exists in life. After life, I say there can't be any fear of death. So the fear of death is not of it's not a fear after death, it's a fear in life of not existing. Um, and all of that fear of death is actually uncomfortableness, it's attachment to outcome. Um, and when that attachment to outcome falls away, that suffering falls away, what we find is we are living life as an experience in the, in the moment, comfortable with life. And the notion of life coming to the end, to an end, is inconsequential. It's like, okay, it's like when I go to sleep at night and I go into deep sleep, the day is finished, the experience of the day is not there, and there's no experience of anything, and there's no one to be unhappy that life doesn't exist. And that's peace. So we know death every day in deep sleep. So the psycholo um, so what is there to fear in death? Death is referred to as mahasamadhi, the ultimate peace. Um, and we know it each day. And so then when we look at our fear of death, we see it's a psychological fear that exists in life. Um, and peace of mind means the end of the fear of death.
I think you're muted now. Okay, I can hear you. Oh, thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> thank you, Laurent. I, uh, I know what I say is not necessarily going to answer the question or be palatable, but uh, it's, uh, it's my answer. So it's the best, best I have for you today. Okay, on, uh, on that note, or oh, is there someone else? Okay, I'll take uh, one more question. Ah, hello, Holger. Mm, hello, Roger. Hi. Um, you, Hi. Make my, you make my heart swing. <laughs> Thank you. It's, um, it's, um, and by the way, Jesus is called the bubbler, too, in the Bible. Called the and what? He talked a lot. What's he? Oh, the all no, right, the okay. Bubbler. And so, um, just give me a moment. I'm a little slow right now. I just have to catch my breath because um, it's. I feel so touched. I mean, this is so nice. How um, um, the simplicity of this whole thing, of this whole life. In a way, it's only source wanting to experience itself and the even the roger cannot die because it doesn't even exist as a separate entity well yes um in theory of course i i agree in yeah, theory sure, yes. in theory in practice um i say well i don't really know source i know source in the form of this source is roger and uh, I am quite certain Roger will cease. Um, and yet, deep down, there is the sense that the essence of Roger um, will just be returning to source. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it, but you are, I am, I mean, you are the source. In theory, yes. No, not in theory. This is your, you say I am. I mean, this is your... Ah, yes. Yeah. You, you, demonst you demonstrate. I mean, for me, I look at life. I see, I see the source in you. This is source just dancing as Roger in front of itself in the form of Holger. I mean, this is for me how it feels, at least to me. Even if I don't know the details. Yeah. So the I am that I, I'm connected to that we all have the capacity to connect to because it is flowing, functioning at the center of our experience all the time. That I am, once again, the concept is that that is um, the consciousness of source. So when we have that concept and we say, I am is the consciousness of source, um, is it? Uh, it's, that's the concept. And if it is, at least what, what, it, what we know is that I am is the first manifestation of source or source in its manifest form. So to be honest, when I'm resting in I amness, um, I don't actually know where it comes from. I don't know what it is. It doesn't tell me anything more than I am. I am aware. Um, it doesn't tell me where it comes from or what it is. And not true. There is not you and I am. There is only I am. True. Yeah. Good, good, good. But we have to, in order for this play of life to keep it alive and functional, there needs to be the duality, otherwise there is no experience. Yes, yes. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Big hug. And uh, um, one thing, how do you do if you see, um, if you see someone suffer, mm -hmm. is this just a projection of yourself or is there really some other suffering whom you could maybe assist a little bit with some different conditioning? Sure. In, or is it better just to be quiet? Uh, 
you're talking about myself or in if you come across someone who's suffering for example or in general yes in in general just um with family or neighbors or friends or um, in general with people who maybe call themselves christians and maybe don't even know what this whole thing is all about yeah it's uh... Are you saying something or you remain quiet um, if you can say something that you think is pertinent and it feels like it um, is, I mean, actually, if you can remain silent, um, that is an amazing uh, movement, actually, to really feel like life, um, life is, this is life, their suffering is life. Um, if compassion arises, you can really just say, look, I'd love to be able to help you, even not put forward any teaching, but really it's like, um, you know, I really feel your, your suffering in life. Um, is there some, especially, you know, if someone's uh, grieving a loss, for example, or feeling very um, full of despair, you can try and just be there as a, a friend or a support. Um, and that can be very um, uh, very supportive. If you're looking at someone who has very strong ideas um, and you would like to help, in quotes, help them, um, often it's because we feel challenged by their ideas and we see if they didn't have these strong extreme views, then that would be less pain for me, so I wish I could help them. <laughs> so that they're free of their suffering, but really maybe it's motivated um, by a wish that their, you know, extreme views aren't thrown into my life and experienced as pain or even turned into suffering. So um, it's important for us to be able to get a sense of why am I wanting to help? Am I wanting to help because I'm attached to outcomes, either the outcome of them stopping delivering pain to me or even the attached to the outcome of them experiencing peace and then being able to say, oh, thank you for helping me. That was so great. And maybe there's an attachment to being appreciated by the other. Or is it simple compassion arising? And then so compassion can arise in a way where we just stay quiet and listen Compassion can arise where we see that they are suffering and the best thing we can do is to just be kind. Or compassion can arise and put forward some concepts that may help shift something. However, if we're putting forward concepts that may help shift something, um, I would suggest it's very important to be very sensitive to see if they're received because... Um, we can easily be well-intentioned in putting forward concepts. And if we don't get a sense for whether they're received or not, we might actually be making the situation worse. The concepts could actually be quite aggressive to someone without us meaning them to be aggressive. Um, it's just not what they want to hear. They could, it could be challenging to their identity and create more suffering. So... Um, I don't have a specific answer, um, but I would say be very mindful of why it is we want to help. And then when we help, um, see whether it's, re it's being received. If it's not received, then we pull back and be quiet. Um, I started a website. I called it healthychristianity.com. Mm -hmm. And um, because I have this... Um, I spent a lot of time reading the Bible and listening to teachings related to the Bible. And to me, um, Jesus is, is just, every one of us is just enlightened reasoning mm -hmm. available to everyone. And so when I, then I'm confronted with Christians, then this always feels so um, hypocritical. And to me, the Bible, it's just so fascinating to combine this non-duality perspective with this ancient Bible, because if you take away the time and space out of the Bible, 
then it just describes our moment in time with all its frictions and mm -hmm. different states of mind. I mean, this is so fascinating to me, and maybe I'm just lost in my own fantasies, but I, tr I believe to see so many connections and um, feel so much life inside of me. I mean, this is just fascinating. Yeah, we'll share it Be, by all means if it feels um, if it feels appropriate. Um, see that as a happening. Um, you know, who knows what God's will is meant to be. Um, the the thing is to be very sensitive because you know a lot of people don't want to hear our ideas on life or our interpretations, especially if it's interpretations of the Bible. People are quite wedded to their interpretation or they are quite inter quite happy not to be um given religion um or spirituality so share it if it if it feels right see what the results are i think um amazing things can happen from from there wonderful thank you so much and you're a very beautiful man and i'm always fascinated about the words that come out of your mouth I mean, I learned so much from you just by listening and by uh, being in your atmosphere and your presence. It's wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Holger. On that note, um, I think we can finish up for today. So I wish everyone peace and see you soon.